The 20th century is arguably the period of history we know the most about. It was a time of amazing innovation and also total war and devastation. But how do we connect that history to the world we find ourselves in now? Joining us now on that, John Higgs, author of Stranger Than We Can Imagine, an alternative history of the 20th century, and we welcome you to this side of the pond, John. Good Hi, to meet Steve. you. Steve. Good to be here. Well, you've got some uh, most fascinating profiles of some well-known and some not-so-well-known individuals from the 20th century in That's your book. True. You're not, I don't think, a historian normally. No, not at all. So where did the idea for this come from? Well, it was, I had an awareness that the, the, the standard uh, narrative of the 20th century, uh, which we all know very well, you know, it starts with the, the First World War, then the Great Depression, the Second World War, Hiroshima, Cold War, fall of Berlin Wall. Um, we all know that story, we all get it. It's just for some, something about it, it doesn't seem to lead into the world we're in now. Um, you know, this world of, um, you know, uh, endless opportunities and constant surveillance and, you know, tsunamis of, of trivia. I just had a, had a sense that it was probably a better story to tell about that period we've been through to, to, to explain the 20th century, 21st century, to, to, to bring us to where we are here. Well, part of that better story that you want to tell starts with Albert Einstein. Why yes. did you want to start with him? Well, it's hard not to start with, with Albert Einstein. It, it's, it's, he, was the, he was so symbolic of this huge, huge upheaval and change. You know, we, we pretty much understand all the great uh, discoveries and innovations and breakthroughs of history up until about the end of the 19th century. You know, we, we, electricity we get, you know, uh, photography, agriculture, language, all these things make total sense. It's just as soon as you get to the 20th century, you hit Einstein and you hit cubism and you hit quantum mechanics and you hit existentialism and postmodernism and chaos mathematics. And all of a sudden, it's just off putting and disturbing. And the temptation, I know I felt it was to go, well, maybe I don't need to know about these things. These are, these are, these are difficult. Um, but the problem with that is it means that if, if you ignore all those things, you're in the 21st century looking at it with 19th century eyes, trying to make sense, trying to wonder why, you know, it doesn't actually make any sense. So the point of the book, the whole uh, aim of the book is to take all those uh, subjects that are individually disconcerting. Um, but luckily, if you put them together, they start to make a lot more sense. Well, here's one guy who, i got to confess, didn't make a hell of a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And maybe that's why he's in the book. Mm. I mean, Einstein, I get. I get why you start with him. But then you go on to talk about a guy I'd never heard of before who mm. crowned himself emperor of the United States many, many years ago. Oh, yes, yes. Who is this guy? Emperor Norton. Yes, yes Emperor, em, Emperor Norton. This was in about the 1860s, um, if you take the exact year. Uh, a homeless guy. Um, he had uh, he'd lost a lot of money. He'd, he'd, um, he was down on his luck. He decided to declare himself the Emperor of the United States of America, uh, Emperor Norton I. Uh, he started dressing the part, the hat, the feathers. Um, and the weird thing was, is that people, if not so much took him seriously, they sort of respected what he was doing. Um, he was, he was, they put boxes in the theatres for him to, to, to go and see. He, he had his own, he printed his own currency and bars would accept it. And he did take himself he, seriously. He, oh, he genuinely believed um, that he was the, you know, God-appointed emperor of the United States. And as a result, it was his duty to get up every morning and be the emperor of the United States. Um, the United States is not a, a country that particularly wants an emperor. Uh, <laughs> it, has to be, it has to be said. Mm -hmm. um, but there was something about, um, at, that, at that point in the 19th century, uh, the rank of an emperor. You know, we, we lived in a world with emperors and tsars and kaisers and these sort of absolute rulers who sat at the pinnacle of society. They were, you know, they, they were the fixed point from which we all understood ourselves. We, we knew our place based on where we were in relation to this, this sort of fixed point at the top. And that all went after the end of the First World well, War. Well, that's, no, I mean, that's the point that it leads it to, because the 19th century, of course, was the age of empire, which mm. leads to World War I and the great, uh, you know, imperial battles there. Mm. And so uh, what does that make the 20th century? Well, that, this is the strange thing. We, we all, there wasn't a clear sense that um, not having emperors was an option, right? We'd, throughout all of history, you know, Alexander the Great from way before, this was just how humans organized themselves with this, this fixed point. Uh, once that was gone, once the, you know, the, uh, the emperor was uh, beheaded often, literally, or shot as the, the Tsar was, um, power, which was 
embodied in this one individual had to go down into the population. And then we start to get universal suffrage, and then we start to try and make sense of things through, through democracy. And it's not easy. It's not easy having all these different competing uh, points of view. Uh, that's to form some form of consensus and, and, and get along. And as a result, we had this very uh, bloody um, uh, period, period of time as we, as we sort of came to terms with the, with the fact that um, we, as individuals, were our own sort of primary sort of focus for, for making sense of the world. Do you find it more problematic to try to understand the world through the eyes of individuals as opposed to, to the one person who represented the whole empire? Yeah, it's, it's obviously... Um, Necessary, you know. I don't think anyone would argue having this this fixed point back, but it was so. It was certainly easier. <laughs> it was a lot. It was a lot easier. You were pretty. You would be judged uh, by where you were in the hierarchy. It didn't matter if you were, you know, smart or, or clever or kind or things like that. It mattered if you were a, a serf or a general. That that's that's what mattered. Mm -hmm. um, so it's necessary for that to have gone. But then, but the twentieth century then becomes this huge period of um, coming to terms with that. Uh, and, and, and trying to sort of find ways to deal with all these conflicting uh, viewpoints. The, the single fixed perspective was, was gone, uh, and we had this relative mass of noise, which is echoed in Einstein, which is echoed in a lot of the modernist um, art. Um, it's just, it's, 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 a, it's a slight and abstract concept when mm -hmm. you're talking about it. But once you recognize it, it explains a hell of a lot about, about who we are and how we became. Well, we are in times, of course, uh, reflected by the rise of the network. And I want to yeah. read a, uh, let me read an excerpt from your book and then I'll get you to amplify mm -hmm. on that if you would. The network has not just reorganized the flow of information around our society. It has imposed feedback loops into our culture. If what we do causes suffering, anger, or repulsion, we will hear about it. Where once we regulated our behavior out of fear of punishment by our Lord and Master, now we adjust our actions in response to the buzzing cloud of verbal judgments from thousands of people. What are you trying yeah. to say here? Yeah, it was, that was a surprise to me. When I started writing the book, I just sort of assumed that the story of the 20th century was the rise of individualism. That, that seemed, you know, self-evident to me. But as I, as I went through it, I, I couldn't deny the fact that the second half of the 20th century was going in a completely different direction. It was taking us into um, this network sense of, our, sense of ourselves. Uh, for, for example, to, for what you were talking about in, in Britain, there was uh, uh, a woman um, was walking home and decided to picked up a cat and put it in, in a bin. I don't know if you ever, ever saw this story, but uh, she, she had a moment of madness. She just picked up a cat and put it in the bin and, and walked on her way. Uh, and if that had been five or ten years earlier, um, nothing would have happened. She would have just, just gone about her business. But because she was seen and that went viral and that was all around the network, you know, she, was, she, was, she lost her job, she was taken to court, she became one of the most hated person, people in the world. Um, you know, we, we're no longer, um, we're no that we're now responsible, essentially, for our actions in a way we weren't before. And this, this is really changing the way we, we see ourselves. The, uh, a, a nice example, I think, is the concept of the selfie. If, like me, you're, you're, you're products of the 20th century and you see someone taking a photo of themselves, you tend to view that as, you know, a individual taking a picture of themselves for reasons of vanity or, or narcissism to see themselves. Um, but, to, you know, to my kids, it's not that at all. You know, it's about strengthening social bonds. It's, it's, about, it's about smiling at their friends. The, the idea of seeing uh, a, a selfie just in that individual terms is ridiculous to them because it doesn't explain what's going on. Uh, and this has been this, um, uh, this, this change that's come about with the internet at the, the early 21st century. Uh, we're now uh, in this networked world and it has changed us fundamentally. There's a part of that that the lover of history, archivist, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a guy who wants to sort of record this moment for posterity uh, kind of digs. Yeah. But I, but uh, do you think it's more nefarious than that? It's. I think it's ultimately good. I think it's ultimately positive. It's it's very traumatic the tra tra the tra um, transition we're going through. Um, there's a sense that uh, the internet can be a mob and can and destroy people. We're only just sort of coming to terms with that and 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 talking about it and and, and trying to to find other ways to do it. It's not it's not a, an easy transition into this network world. There's been this wave of transparency that sort of affected every single. Um, 
organisation uh, that there is, for example, everywhere from FIFA, certainly to the British House of Commons, uh, a lot of police forces, um, uh, a, a, a lot of Catholic Church, um, there's uh, the scandals. Um, they've all come out at once. You know, uh, all these um, corrupt um, goings on of the 20th century were sort of hidden away. Um, but because of the way information flows uh, differently now, um, we, we're seeing everything. We, we're seeing all the all the shock, and it's shocking. It's it's disturbing. But yeah, it's... you would think though that the, the that with all of this public shaming going on, mm. it would result in people behaving better. I it think, doesn't appear to be though, does I it? I think ultimately it will. Huh. It's just we're in that very traumatic period <laughs> of of transition. How um, long is it going to last? This traumatic period. Uh, if as, hopefully it'll be over by Christmas. <laughs> I'm, I'm an optimist. <laughs> it, it, may, it may take that a bit. Doesn't longer. give us much time, John. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, it is true that. that that, um, you know, you can't behave badly in public now and get away with it anymore. You just can't. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, your House of Commons in Great Britain is a great example of Very this. Very good example, and yes. And yet it doesn't appear to have had a tempering effect on the behavior of or the notion of what you can get away with over there. Why do you think oh, not? I, th I think it is. I, th I, oh, th think, I think it's it starting mm -hmm. to. A lot of, a lot of the, the corruption we're dealing with is, is historic. And, you know, in, in the 20th century, Watergate was a major scandal. Mm -hmm. The links between Nixon and those burglars took an awful lot of um, legislative time, a, a lot of attention of the press to deal with and process. And now that seems trivial. You know, that, that seems... We've got so many more, some deeper, some more disturbing scandals being being uncovered um, that we'd love to be back in the in the days but I, I think once we work through this backlog of, of corruption and and um, uh, uh, yeah and, and, the, and the horrible things that used to happen in this age of individuals I don't see them appearing at least as regularly um, in the in the age of networks I don't think it can really happen Bit of an offbeat question here, mm. because you've written this alternative history of the 20th century. Mm. Are you glad to be alive today, or would you have preferred to live during another time in history? No, I like today. Really? How today come? Today would be brilliant. Well, I mean, there's a lot of history I love and would love to see, but you just have to um, uh, go back to the days before dentists to sort of realize that maybe <laughs> it wouldn't have been quite so good. The amount well, how about 50 years in the future? Would you rather be alive then? Uh, yeah, I'd love I, mean, to, I would, be, I would I... love to, well, well, hopefully, but uh, yeah. I would love to see 50 years in the future. I mean, there's a lot of, of things to be concerned about. Um, we're, now, now we understand uh, chaos mathematics and, and, uh, and complex systems. You know, we understand the atmosphere. We understand what's going on there. We, you know, we, we can't um, hide from that. You know, the, the future is troubling in, in, in many, many ways. Um, but this... this just change into seeing ourselves as part of a network um, has to has to help. It has to sort of it has to uh, it opens up conversations. It opens up suggestions. It opens up ideas that we would not not normally have had. It connects people uh, who would never normally speak together. Um, and if any, history tells us anything, that that's that's where um, the advances come from. So that's a, a, a hopeful vision of the future. I'm an optimist, yes. You are an optimist. Yes. Uh, the name of the book is Stranger Than We Can Imagine, an alternative history of the 20th century. Ceci n'est pas l'histoire, as you tell us. En français, monsieur aussi. Absolutely. John Higgs, our guest. Thanks so much for visiting us at TVO tonight. A uh, pleasure. Thanks. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.